right. Being that this is our annual meeting, I will hand it over to the superintendent, Superintendent Moore. Good evening. <clears throat> for our first order of business, in making nominations for the chair and vice chair, a second is not required. Once all nominations have been made, a motion is made to close the nominations and the motion is seconded. Ballots will be handed out to each board member to vote and sign and pass to council who will tabulate. Lacking a majority, a second vote and subsequent votes will be necessary. The ballots are a matter of public record. Are there nominations for the chair of the Wake County Board of Education? Madam Superintendent, I nominate enthusiastically Lindsay Mahaffey. Is there a motion to close the nominations? No. A second. On, up to the second onto the nomination. Is there a motion to close the nomination? So moved. Okay. Second. So ballots are now distributed. Do they have them? Okay, go ahead. You've already got the votes. Okay. You're oh. Is there a motion to close the nom? Is there what the vote? All in favor of closing the nominations, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So you already have the the ballots. Um, so just circle and sign, and then it can be just passed around to me, and I'll I will tabulate them. I recognize we only have one candidate, but board policy does state that it's that the election of chair and vice chair is done by written ballot, so we will follow policy. Thank you. Congratulations, Ms. Mahaffey, on being elected again to the chair of, of the Wake County Board of Education. All right. Thank you very much. I'll pass it back over. <laughs> All right. At this time, we will have take nominations for vice chair. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I, move, I would nominate Ms. Uh, Chris Haggerty for vice chair, please. All right. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Are there further nominations for the position of vice chair? Once, twice, all right, hearing none. Is there a motion to close nominations for the vice chair position? So moved. Second. All right, thank you, Ms. Waters and Ms. Johnson Hostler. Any discussion? All those in favor to close nominations for vice chair, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? All right, please. Circle your nominee and sign your ballot and pass it back over to Mr. Blumberg. Okay. Uh, our nominations are set. Is there anything you want to say? 
I just want to thank my fellow board members for trusting me with this leadership position again. I know we've been through some difficult times. We have some exciting opportunities ahead of us, and I'm excited about this group, and I think we all bring different strengths, and I'm excited to see where we'll go working together. Thank you. Well said. Ditto. Um, let us, but in all honesty, thank you for your confidence in, um, in this leadership, and again, I'm con Continuing to look, I'm looking forward to continue working with you and start working with uh, the majority of you here. Um, with that, our annual meeting is closed, and uh, we will move in to our Board of Education meeting. So this may take some time. Our new board members, you're going to find this in the meetings listing, and if you are not already logged into Simbly. Um, you will not need to be logged in until closed session, uh, but if you would like some help, we can take a moment and a brief pause. You got it. All right. Well, Welcome to our first regular board meeting of this new board. Um, welcome to all of our new members. Um, and um, I would pass it over to the superintendent for her comments. Good evening. A stated goal as a school district is to prepare students for productive citizenship as well as college or career. Three recent career readiness events gave hundreds of students experience and insight into how they can succeed in the job market. First, more than 500 11th graders from our college and career academies participated in an internship summit at the McKimmon Center. Students heard from former interns about their experiences, got tips on resumes and interviews, and learned about workplace ethics and writing in a professional setting. Junior Achievement of Eastern North Carolina helped bring together 70 volunteers from more than 30 businesses for the event. Second, the American Heart Association and Go Red for Women partnered to host the STEM Goes Red event at All Scripps in North Hills. This day-long event was an immersive experience for more than 100 middle school girls interested in STEM careers. Female leaders in STEM fields spoke to the students about career opportunities and led them in fun activities around STEM and personal health. Participating schools included Alston Ridge Middle School, Durant Road Middle School, Heritage Middle School, Hilburn K-8 STEAM Academy, Moore Square Magnet Middle School, and Zebulon Magnet Middle School. And third, the Wake Forest Area Chamber Foundation held its first annual Wake Forest Entrepreneurs Academy pitch competition. Middle and high school students pitched inventive business ideas to a panel of judges with the hopes of winning seed money to get their businesses off the ground. Business ideas ranged from handmade jewelry to apps for personal chef services to scented perfume bracelets. Judges awarded 11 students with seed money ranging from $1,000 to $6,000. A total of $20,000 provided by local business donations was distributed to students. The WCPSS winners were Catherine Toledo, Delaney Skinner, and Ella Garlington from Wake Forest High, Kayla Jacoby from Wakefield High, Jalen Costin from Rollsville High, and Finley McNair from Wakefield Middle. Additional mentorship support will be provided to all students who participated in the final competition. A common thread in all of these events is the strong support from our business community. My thanks to all who shared their time and talents to help guide our students to brighter futures. Lastly, I would like to congratulate students from Wake Forest Elementary and Stow Magnet Elementary who had their projects accepted into the 2022 National Chinese Expo of Student Works. This year's theme was the joy of Chinese language and culture learning, and students produced videos, posters, and other works in reflection and celebration of that theme. 
out of the more than 4,000 students from 47 states and Canada who participated in this event, only 300 works were selected for the online exhibition. The winners from Wake Forest Elementary's Mandarin World Language programs are Alexis Hummel, Ronald Lassiter, and Isaac Cook, as well as a first grade project led by teacher Lang Hong Leo. Emma Christie and Benjamin Christie won from Stao Mandarin Immersion Magnet Chinese Elementary School. You can find all of this year's selected works by visiting ChineseExhibition.com. Parent surveys have demonstrated a strong demand for world language instruction, and we have added that program at several schools in recent years. The success of these students really does show that our world language programs are of benefit, getting stronger, and supporting students. Congratulations to all. Concludes my comments. Thank you, Superintendent Moore. I would like to take a moment to honor the life of Karen Sinders, um, beloved principal at Lufkin Road Middle School, who passed away unexpectedly on November 21st. Karen believed passionately in the power of education to change the world one student at a time, but her most lasting legacy will be the genuine love that she showed to her students and staff over her decades as a teacher, assistant principal, and principal. There are countless of students and staff members whose lives are better because of Karen Sinders. And after many years of working as an educator in Indiana, she became the principal of Lufkin Road Middle School in 2012. Her impact and now her loss are felt deeply at that school and in the community of Apex and beyond. The Lufkin Road PTA calls her a woman of grace with a keen awareness that Lufkin is not just a school, but a home for our students. That stick spirit represents the very best of what is being an educator and principal is all about. And I share that profound sense of sadness, loss, and shock brought about by her sudden passing. The best we can do to honor her legacy is to emulate the love she spread everywhere that she went. In our schools and in the larger world, may we remember Karen by always putting people first and by living a life full of joyful service. And with that, I ask you all to join me in a moment of silence in memory of Principal Karen Sinders. Thank you all. It's hard to switch gears um, after something like that, but certainly we want to honor the legacy of somebody who impacted so many members of our community. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the first meeting of this new Board of Education in Wake County Public Schools. Over the next few weeks and months, we will be working together, building what has been referred to as our team of 10. And this learning curve as a new member of this board is a steep one. But please know you're not alone in this journey. You have other board members to lean on, as well as an incredible professional staff who is able to help you. Um, and I remember my first year on the board, uh, I probably sent the most. Let me forward your email to a staff member that can better answer your your question or query. This district was founded back in 1976 after the merger of the Raleigh City Schools and the Wake County School District. Um, and its legacy has continued on. Um, we have a new strategic plan that we will be working on as a board. And I just want to say welcome again. And from here, anything is possible by sure Her thank you chair Mahaffey and again welcome to all of our new board members five of nine new faces but not new to our community and not new to you know our parents our schools uh, we're excited to have you here typically in our board comments we'll talk about issues that 
are important that are facing the board, sometimes things that we've done out in the district. It can be a good way, a positive way to highlight some of the work in our schools. Sometimes, you know, in a world that seems inundated with social media and uh, shock headlines, it's good to share some of the good stories and things that you see in the community. And we have a lot of, a lot of good things going on in our district right now. A lot of our schools are going through their Pieces of Gold auditions. And this is a wonderful arts showcase, if you're not familiar with it, where from elementary to high school, we'll see just the best and brightest of our, of our young arts students performing in a professional setting. And it's really inspiring. We saw Millbrook High School go on a history historic run in the football the football playoffs. They came a little short, but without uh, Miss Cash here to toot Millbrook's horn, Mr. Ring, this is Dr. Ring, this is going to fall on you to uh, take care of your Wildcats. Um, you'll have help. You'll have some help. There's a family connection over here as well. Uh, and a graduate. Oh, well, we're outnumbered. We are. Um, and, you know, I had a great chance. We had an opening of a time capsule at Jeffreys Grove Elementary back from 1996. So yeah, that was exciting for those of us who were in Raleigh in the 1990s. You remember Hurricane Fran and some of the things that were going on in town. But at the same time, uh, Principal Juli Ventura really took it as an opportunity to talk about the history of the school. You know, in District 7, I have some of the newest public schools in our district. Jeffreys Grove Elementary is one of our oldest. It's almost 100 years old, founded around 1925, and it became one of you know, the Rosenwald schools that sometimes we'll bring in and, and showcase here, talking about the history of the district. Um, and so I just want to commend her and her staff for the great historic presentation they put together for the parents and the community. Again, why are we here? We all have individual uh, statements of our motivations, but I think in our hearts it's all about keeping the students in front, our students, our staffs, keeping our schools healthy, making progress and moving forward. And so as we go forward this year, we have – you know, unfinished business to take up and move forward with. We, we're doing great work on our bullying and harassment policy and ways to protect our students there. We have our academic recovery programs that are up and going. We had our Wake Together kickoff. I know some of you were there, and we got to see some of the tutors working directly with students um, at Southeast Raleigh Elementary and uh, kind of celebrating our great partnership with the Y, the Boys and Girls Club, and other partners. And, you know, we'll continue to focus on academic achievement. So a lot of great things ahead of us, a lot of exciting uh, work to do, and I'm excited to see uh, everyone's take on how we move forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ms. Johnson-Hossler, I know this is not your favorite part, but going first. So, but I will ask you today if you would mind going first. I wouldn't say it's favorite or not, but nonetheless, thank you. And thank you all who are still here with us in person and those of you online. And again, um, my gratitude, sincere gratitude to the voters and constituents of District 2 for entrusting me to sit in this seat um, yet another term. Um, so again, to all of you here and those of you watching, thank you very much for your support. Um, of my campaign, but also more importantly for your support of Wake County Public Schools. Um, everyone who is engaged in the electoral pro process truly is a reflection to our students of the importance um, of our rights and our civic duties. Um, so thank you all for engaging in the process. And I am um, glad to be back in this seat. And I will certainly also acknowledge in the line of history, um, when I came on this board in 2013, it was the first time since the merger of Raleigh Wake County Public Schools that there had been more than one person of color on this board. So Keith Sutton and I, and the only reason there were two people in 1975 is because of the merger of the school districts. And so in 2013, um, nearly my age, over 40 plus years, there had not been more than one person of color. This board is indeed historic. It is diverse. And it is truly what I hope that we are showing our kids and our community is what representation looks like, because representation does matter. And so sitting at this table, and more importantly, sitting next to another person, um, both younger um, but also a person of color, um, a black man sitting next to me, speaks volumes to the way in which we have moved in this country. And I think it's also reflective of my commitment and ongoing commitment um, 
of our board and our school district of really diving deep into what does it look like for equity. One of the major tools um, that we have in our power as a board is our policies. And so my personal commitment I reinstate to you today is to really be clear that equity matters and it will not be a topic that we ran on or talked about during the election, but we will really hold ourselves, those of us who are returning, um, we all agree that when we invested in passing the policy that we will invest in moving that policy forward. I look forward to working with all of our board members and I think one of the things that we've already realized and it's, I would say, after going through an election, there's no imagination of what it means to be on this side of the table until you're on this side of the table. Um, it truly is very different than anything that you've done to lead yourself to Wake County Public Schools to be on this side of the table. But one of the things that I've told each of you, and I do believe it most sincerely in my heart, is that once we're at this table, we are indeed a team of 10, and every person here is committed to the greater good, to ensuring Wake County Public Schools is the best choice of a high quality public education for all of our students in Wake County. So I look forward to working with the entire team, um, our, my fellow board members, our superintendent, and our amazing staff. And thank you all for your support. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Johnson Hostler. Ms. Waters. Well, thank you and congratulations, Madam Chair and uh, Vice Chair Haggerty. I'm excited to continue to have your leadership uh, go before me. As you all know, I was appointed to the board in March, and so I'm very grateful to have another opportunity to represent uh, the district where I grew up. And so very honored to be around the table with um, our new colleagues. So welcome, and I look forward to um, working together. I'm just a few months ahead of you, so I'm glad to help um, if I can. And and so I uh, would like to uh, just highlight um, and echo um, Ms. Johnson Hostler's uh, remarks around equity and the diversity around this table. That's a beautiful thing. And I'd like to highlight a little bit about what's going on in District 4. Um, had a chance to go to Wilburn Elementary School on Friday morning, and Ms. Johnson Hostler uh, joined me there. I think we were both delighted to see our first graders and be able to engage in reading with our young students. And so that's one of the best parts about being on the Board of Education, the opportunity to go into our school communities. And so you're all invited to come out to Wilburn Elementary and read with first graders um, as um, one of your first um, invitations. Uh, so uh, feel um, invited. And then I'd like to also highlight Bug Elementary for their winter showcase. It was quite an exciting event and the music and the art showcase was really amazing. One of my um, favorite art teachers, Mr. Quentin Neal, did an amazing job and he also came and uh, dressed as a snowman so that was a real highlight for the students there in the school community. And when the um, District's line shifted a little bit. I um, was fortunate enough to uh, see some new schools come to District 4, and the last school that I needed to visit in District 4, which was added, was Riverbend Middle, and boy, was that an amazing visit. Um, Principal Weddle and the entire school community are just doing amazing work. They are just an example of excellence in education. I appreciated being able to visit some of the special education classrooms and to see our teachers hard at work, and there was one classroom visit um, where we had some of our students um, who have some more complex needs and the teachers were so committed they were actually wearing the same outfit um, and superhero shirts just to show um, solidarity with our students and to show um, their commitment. So I really appreciated that and I also appreciated just the beautiful auditorium of the school and perfect timing. I got a chance to see um, a dance performance, a musical performance and also visit the art room and so there are some amazing schools in Wake County and so I am so fortunate to continue to represent District 4 and look forward to even more opportunities to get out to our school communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waters. All right, new board members, just remember to push that button and when the, if the green light is on, we can hear you. Ms. Edmonds, why don't you start us off? Thank you. I feel honored. Um, I first want to thank the two of you uh, Chair Mahaffey and Vice Chair Haggerty for being willing to continue your leadership. I think that's important for continuity as we are a majority of new members now. So thank you for your willingness to do that. And I'm thrilled that the rest of us were unified in supporting you in that leadership. 
I visited uh, Dillard Elementary for um, their book fair night uh, soon after the election and got to read to students. And I want to thank their media coordinator, Ms. Joyce, for inviting me to do that. On the same night, I got to go to Washington Elementary for their math and science night. Our children uh, both attended Washington Elementary, so it was a lot of fun to be back there. And I was especially glad to see on math and science night that the tradition of the courtyard egg drop continues. So that was great. I am eager to visit all of the schools in District 5. So to the principals and staff at my schools and PTA leaders, um, please reach out to me and invite me to your special events and um, or even just a meeting, a tour, etc. I'm very anxious to come and see you and be in those spaces with you. The, um, the District 5 BAC will meet after the new year, so I'm um, have welcome anyone that is currently on the BAC to continue um, as long, you know, if your term hasn't expired, I'm happy to have you stay on. And um, myself and with the help of Ms. Allen will be following up to make the BAC continue to happen in 2023. And then finally, I just want to express my um, deep sympathies to the Swift Creek Elementary community. They uh, recently lost a fifth grader due to a hit and run accident that actually happened very close to my house. Um, so I know that they're grieving and I want them to know that I'm thinking of them and the child's family and um, her friends and loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edmonds. Dr. Ng. Thank you so much. Um, again, uh, I really appreciate the, um, the support uh, from everyone so far on the board who, who has welcomed me on. And uh, it's, um, it's a tough act to follow, really, to follow uh, Mrs. Cash. Um, but uh, I, you know, one of the things I, I gathered from her was how important it was to have a uh, relationship with the principals and the staff uh, at the schools, and that's something that I want to continue on uh, to uh, foster those relationships and to be able to uh, really get to know the needs of the individual schools. And, and the schools are just so different, every one of them. And I really want to get to know them and be able to um, uh, f find out what what uh, uh, kind of uh, concerns they have and and what kind of things that I can do as a school board member to represent their voice and and also um, you know to also represent the voice of the parents uh, the vo that that are uh, there to um, in entrust their kids to our schools and so I really want to make sure that I, I hear them and to be able to respond to them and uh, well, I, again I thank you so much for um, all the support all the people who have um, um, uh, voted for me but also the people do, who did not vote for me um, that uh, I can hopefully uh, earn their earn their respect so thank you so much Thank you. Mr. Hershey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for District 6, so far uh, I've been to 12 of our 22 schools. So if you haven't seen me yet, I'm coming. I will be there soon. Um, I look forward to meeting all the principals, uh, to touring the schools. I've, I've been on some great tours. I've met some great staff already, uh, watched some classes, um, just watching our students work, uh, it, it's, uh, it gives me so much energy to do this job, actually, to be in those schools and to see how hard they're working and to, to see what everyone's doing. As it relates to BACs, we have a lot of openings at our schools, um, and we will be working very hard to fill that. We want to really uh, get more parents involved in those meetings, invite more parents to those meetings. And if those who are currently on the BAC, I hope that you will stay. Um, if you are not interested in staying, please reach out and let me know. I think we have 14, at least 14 openings right now across District 6. So that will be a priority and we will be setting up a meeting probably for February. Um, and I welcome any and all ideas for what parents and PTAs and staff would like to see at those meetings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Swanson. I was hoping it was going to go to Ms. Caulfield. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm honored to, I'm honored uh, again. I um, want to congratulate our chair and vice chair on your reelection. And to my colleagues, I look forward to working with you all as we 
continue to push our district forward. I'm also very honored to sit here as the youngest board member, 29 years old, um, and looking at the diversity and also honored to see that for the first time on this board that four out of the five seats or nine seats are held by people of color. And so I think that is such a historic and I hope that our students can see themselves beyond the classroom to the board table and even beyond because truly from here anything is possible. Um, and so I look forward to working with the staff and to the parents and students and teachers to continue to serve and to serve as that champion for all students, teachers, and families. And so we have some work ahead of us, and I look forward to diving into that work and working collaboratively, collaboratively with my colleagues. And so I'm honored, and to the schools in District 9, I have not gotten out there yet. Um, they're coming, and so I look forward to visiting and learning uh, the great things that are happening in the schools in District 9. So thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Caulfield, close us out. Thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Um, we've had a warm welcome here, and it's been nice to actually sit down and, and get to know everybody, some of you I met today. Um, I'm very excited to get started, um, and I want to say thank you to all the people that did actually vote and trust in us advocating for them. Um, I've got to go around and meet a couple of our leaders and educators and, and speak and share stories. Um, and hear what it is that's important to them. And I look forward to sitting on the board and working with every one of you and trying to work towards what it is that we can do for our teachers and for our students and bringing the families together and doing the best we can for our children. And as far as the BAC, um, I would love, encourage anybody to reach out. Um, I would love to meet with more people and um, get to know who would want to be on board and kind of jump in with us. So thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you guys. All right. Thank you all. At this point, if you look back at your meeting agenda, it's now time to approve the meeting agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to approve tonight's meeting agenda. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of approving tonight's meeting agenda, Please signify with a vote of aye. aye. Yeah. Any opposed, nay. The meeting agenda is approved. We now move on to public comment. Speakers commenting on items on the night's agenda will be heard before speakers commenting on other topics. All speakers will be heard in order of the way they signed up. If the public comment portion of the agenda exceeds 30 minutes, the board policy states that the board reserves the right to conduct other board business before inviting the remaining speakers to the podium. Members of the public are welcome to offer comments or criticism distracted at substantive ideas, actions, or procedures of the board and individual board members. The laws and policies of North Carolina provide that issues or concerns involving individual personnel matters are confidential and therefore not appropriate for public comment settings. Concerns related to personnel issues may be addressed through applicable WCPSS personnel, the grievance policy or other applicable policies. Those offering comments to the board, including students may discuss issues and matters of general concern but should refrain from discussing confidential student information. Concerns related to confidential student matters may be addressed through applicable WCPSS personnel, the grievance policy, or other applicable policies. During public comment, you may speak for up to three minutes. A green light will illuminate at the podium when you begin. A yellow light will light up along with an audio signal when there are 30 seconds remaining in your time and a red light along with an audible tone will signal your time is up and it is time for the next speaker who will be called to the podium. In the interest of maintaining civility and decorum, speakers are encouraged to address their comments to the Board of Education and to refrain from personal attacks and insults directed at the board, individual board members, staff, or members of the general public. Please remain at the podium during your speaking time. Any materials you wish to share with the board should be handed to the board attorney before or after your comments. These Board of Education meetings are conducted for the purpose of carrying on the official business of the school system. The public 
is cordially invited to attend and speak at these meetings as it conducts its official business. Persons who willfully interrupt, disrupt, or cause disturbances at an official meeting may be directed to leave by the presiding officer. Members of the audience should show respect for speakers by refraining from loud comments or other disruptions. Disruptions by any person or persons of a public meeting will be subject to action in accordance with General Statute 143-318.17. And have we gotten the list of speakers? Okay. Let me refresh and see if it's here. I don't have it. Okay, first up is Brittany Lara. Thank you, Superintendent Moore. Good evening. My name is Brittany Lara, and I'm a social worker in the eastern part of the county. I wanted to speak to you about an issue that's really close to me and my colleagues. I recently had two little boys, and they're the absolute light of my life. However, we didn't expect to have two, and I didn't expect to have hyper and Mrs. Gravidarum. HG is a rare pregnancy sickness which includes excessive vomiting, dehydration, severe aversions, tooth decay and loss, and in some instances, organ failure and death. Unfortunately, mine was severe. I almost ended up with a pick line and feeding tube and was hospitalized three times and ended up having to get IV fluids three times per week. My organs started shutting down. When all is said and done, we roughly owe $15,000 in medical bills and $15,000 in dental work. That's all related to HG. My son Bryson spent six days in the NICU due to complications and I ended up having to have emergency surgery. My wife also had complications and ended up with surgery and that's just the tip of the iceberg for us. It's RSV season and I'm scared out of my mind there's gonna be more hospital visits that we cannot afford. We make too much money for any kind of assistance and I've reached out to several medical social workers and all I got was start a GoFundMe page because there was no resources. Why am I telling you guys this? Because I need you to know what we are struggling with. Because of my medical and dental debt, I'm no longer able to afford to live on my salary. We don't have family support. I spend my Saturdays visiting food pantries, the same pantries that I give my families and it's impacting the time that I get to spend with my children. My time is already limited with them throughout the week and now I'm missing out on the important things that I shouldn't have to miss out on as a first time parent. I often ask myself when I'm looking at my bank account and there's only $70 left, how do I afford formula, diapers, and gas to even get to work? What if an emergency happens? We're not spending our money unwisely. We've looked at it over and over and over again. We don't go out to eat, we don't go shopping, and my wife has a second job on the weekends. I can't even afford to get my babies anything for Christmas. The fact of the matter is, is that we're not getting paid according to our degrees. I have a master's degree to help break the cycle of poverty, but it seems as if Wake County Public School System is perpetuating it by not paying social workers according to the degree that they are requiring. The same degree that other student services workers get master's pay for. And that's it for now. Thank you. And Ms. Lara, I know you emailed us yesterday. Um, staff is looking into your query, so someone will be in touch with you, so. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carrie Bly. Picked the wrong day to kind of wing it for the first time in four years. Sorry about that. Um, Wake County sent me a good email today about our advocacy and one that gives us hope 
that resources might be coming soon, so I told them I'd be nice. If you don't know us, or the parents that have been asking Wake County to provide comprehensive math learning materials in middle and high schools for four years. Now, whether I'm the one asking a question or I'm the one answering it, my favorite answer to any hard question will always be, I don't know. Even better, I don't know, but I will find out for you. Just to give you a little background, our kid asked us for help with his sixth grade math class homework, and he said he didn't have anything to learn from, and I told him that I could figure out, I couldn't figure out how to do these problems, and I didn't know where to go to learn, but I would find that answer for him. And we hope you can appreciate this new board with our new history, that that's all Pete and I have been trying to do for four years, is find that answer for him. We shouldn't be in this room. We should have never been in this room. Children and parents should not have to beg for learning materials in any core subject in any public school system ever. Now, I'm technically a college dropout, and all I had to do six years ago was physically flip through the math workbooks you gave my child to understand that there was no math learning content in them. And I'll quote this 2017 article again. Traditional tech book, textbooks aren't coming back the way we know them, and that's fine as long as what replaces them has the proper reference material. And I say this quite often, that information needs to get from point A to point B. The old school board, well, some of you that have known us for a long time, have heard these things many, many times. But when there's a problem, sometimes I like to ask people, what do I need to do to get you out of here? Don't y'all want to know what to do to get us out of here? I was just talking about this earlier. When Wake County can slide across the table enough information to reteach me math, a math skill, then I'll know that you can teach my child because that's our biggest problem. I left here after your second SAC meeting feeling like the only parent in Wake County that was having a problem. And I pulled into the Chick-fil-A and I was a young high school girl working there and I just blurted out, how's your math? <laughs> Wake County, how's your math class? And you wouldn't believe what she told me. It was horrible. They moved too fast. They don't understand. I'm failing. This was just a drive through Chick-fil-A. I encourage you all to do that. This is a good example. This is a problem my child brought to me last night. I understand it's order of operations. I understand I have to isolate X just from my high school experience. I don't know how to solve it. I don't know where to go to get the information. I don't know what you call it. I don't know if it's a module, a tool, Scott's workout. And you can solve it for me. Thank you, Ms. Bly. Pete Bly. Hi. Good to see you all. Welcome to all the new board members. My name is Pete Bly. We'll all get to know each other pretty well over the next little while. As my wife just told you, we've been coming here uh, just shy of about four years now talking about uh, the math curriculum. So a little different twist today. I, uh, I was actually a panelist um, for, at my work on a glo global call for International Day of People with Disabilities. I was on this call for the new folks on the board who may not know our backstory because I'm the father of a daughter on the autism spectrum. And I was talking through what it's like being a parent of a child who's on the spectrum and how you can help them. And one of the questions we got on there from a lot of folks, because we were talking about also people who are in the workplace who have special needs, and one of the questions we got was, how do you, you know, talk to someone like that? How do you go through, um, you know, coaching and mentoring and things like that? And I said it was very easy <clears throat> because everybody looks at folks with special needs and you think that there's something wrong and there's not. They just see the world a different way. Everyone has strengths. Everyone has weaknesses. And the best way to manage somebody like that is to try and put them in a situation where you can build towards their strengths and not towards their weaknesses. And in that moment, I thought of what I was going to tell you tonight, which is the current math program that you have does not do that. If you're in the mainstream norm, you can probably get by with what you're doing. But if you see the world in a different way, you do not have resources to help those people. You don't. You didn't before COVID. 
You didn't during COVID, you don't after COVID. This is not a COVID issue. It is an issue of not having things to be able to help when you are not part of the mainstream. My ask is very simple for all of you tonight, everyone who is new on the board. I've heard that there are new materials that are coming and I'm very excited to see that. But while you're evaluating these materials, while you're evaluating new programs, while you are looking at what they are pitching you on what we should use with our students in Wake County, my ask is, is to not just look at it from the lens of everyone who is in the 80% norm. I ask you to look at it from those who are not. Do these materials give students who do not see the world the same way we do the ability to succeed? Do these materials give them the option to be able to understand and to learn? It doesn't matter if it's math or English or art or science or any of the other things that you guys are going to be evaluating over the next little while. Look at it from both views, because if it doesn't, you are not there. It is not good. It is not rigorous. It will not help. You have to have something that will allow people who do not learn the same way the rest of us do to give them the ability to become productive um, citizens and college and career ready, as Superintendent Moore talked about earlier today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bly. Our next speaker is Hyung Nguyen. Hello, my name is um, Fung Nguyen, but I go by Helen because it's just easy to pronounce. I am finishing up for Brittany Nguyen, well, Brittany Lara, she hasn't changed her last name yet, uh, my wife, about mass pay for social workers. Not a single one of the 100 plus school social workers in our county has anything less than masters. We are held to the same standards as psychologists and counselors, yet we are getting paid an average of $5,000 less than they are. How is that ethical? We social workers are the first line of, of contact when any kind of crisis occurs at our school, yet we are getting paid significantly less than others on the same team. Me and Brittany know, personally know a social worker who has to work two full-time jobs just to keep her head above water. Even other social workers are getting paid significantly more just because of the date of their obtained degree. We are losing social workers left and right. The week of November 1st, we lost three. We help families in poverty every single day while we are trying to figure out how to clothe, feed, and care for our own. This story isn't uncommon throughout our social work department. I have several um, social work members who also have to go to food pantries to feed their families. We need a change, and we need it now. We need your help. Our families are suffering because we cannot keep social workers in schools. We are assets to any school we approach. Together, we have helped over 2,000 students and families with clothing, Christmas presents, snacks, and French referrals. We have completed suicide screenings, created crisis plans, led funny tummy feelings, counseled students, connected families with mental health resources, attended IEP meetings, intervened while students are having a crisis. The list can go on and on. All of this was done within our two years of being with Wake County Public School System. We are phenomenal social workers. We know our worth and it's more than what the county is giving us. We need master pay and we need it now. All of our financial burdens could be alleviated with master's pay. We all have access, excuse me, you all have access to funds that we do not. We cannot afford to continue losing great social workers of the, because of the pay. Our families and children will suffer because of it. I really hope you consider what has all been said and consider the devastation that this has caused. Please don't force us to leave the jobs that we truly, truly love. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Soselski. Good evening. Uh, my name is Richard Soselski. I'm director and founder of Carolina Ocean Studies. Our organization has been providing coastal field trips to Wake County students for over 30 years. We take school groups to some of the most magnificent islands on the East Coast. I'm here tonight regarding Wake County Public School System's recent policy shift that it no longer allows field trips which utilize boats that are over 26 feet. 
This is due to an exclusion in the system's liability coverage. This policy excludes Wake County students from visiting the Cape Lookout Lighthouse, from seeing the wild horses of Shockford Banks or going to Hammocks Beach State Park, and from discovering the miles of deserted beaches on Masonboro Island. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wake students are also unable to use any of the state of North Carolina theories, all of which are well over 26 feet. I'm currently working with the system's risk management office and very much appreciate the attention and professionalism in their attempt to resolve this issue. We hope that within the next month, it can be worked out so that your students can explore the wonders of the national parks and national estuarine reserves uh, that we visit. Uh, during our program, students learn through hands-on discovery. They collect and investigate marine life, they explore deserted beaches, and experience some of the best natural learning environments on the East Coast. These programs bring the curriculum to life in ways that education research shows can, that can be significant keys in motivating learning. And since we began in 1992, we've conducted over 800 programs for over 50,000 Wake County students. Some Wake schools have made this an annual field trip for over 20 years. We are proud to have been a long-standing, had, had a long-standing role in Wake County Schools curriculum, and we are honored by our association with such a progressive and high-achieving system. Our programs are approved by the National Park Service, and they are endorsed by the state of North Carolina. Regarding safety, our organization has the highest level of safety standards. We have a superior safety record, and as documented in materials that we, will be shared with Wake County. Uh, and traveling on passenger boats in general that are under the regulatory authority of the United States Coast Guard is one of the safest means of transportation in the country. The United States Coast Guard is one of the strictest and most thorough of fed federal regulators. The vast majority of Wake County schools that take part in our programs uh, take field trips uh, out to Masonboro Island with us. The short route to Masonboro Island takes groups across waters that are more sheltered than the waters of Jordan Lake. Uh, thank you for any support that you can provide that can enable your students to once again explore these islands. For they are natural treasures. They're part of the essence of our state. They are our Yosemite and their special qualities and their abundance and diversity of life and their breathtaking beauty and in their wildness. They are rich in educational opportunities and benefits, and they are all of ours to discover. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chad Stahl. Hello. I'm glad November is over. Uh, I just wanted to bring a couple of things here because we do have a, a new panel here. So welcome all. And I wanted to just share a couple of thoughts. Uh, number one is some of the new policies that are coming out. Uh, I think before the break, Ms. Cash even referenced the concept of equity is not taking from one to give to another. But when you look at the photo that's used to discuss equity, it's like an adult on a box, a kid on a box, and like a person in a wheelchair with like a box next to them. And then the next picture shows the kid with two boxes, the adult with no box, and then the person in the wheelchair on a ramp. So if it's not about taking from one, then I ask, where did the adult's box go? Why can't we just build the ramp, give the kid a box, and the adult keep their box? So I just would challenge that a little bit, because uh, the photo clearly demonstrates that the adult's box gets taken away. Uh, also, policy code 3515, religion in the schools. I'm just going to hit the one uh, line here that I think is important. The board will neither advance nor inhibit any religion or religious belief, viewpoint, expression, or practice. I find this to be important because when you get into the equity policy, policy code 1150, there's some things in there that just seem to open the door a little bit too much for me. So um, in line item 10, it says, in what ways do I center students and affirm their lived experiences, culture, and identities? So if a child, you know, if they identify with a religious identity, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever, right? So it, are you, is the intention to try to affirm each one of those students based on their individual beliefs, or you see, it just I think it opens the door for a lot of uh, gray area, and I think that uh, your it says this policy supersedes any other board policy that is inconsistent with it. So I think it's very important to remember that you know religion and schools policy code thirty five fifteen. 
the next thing, there's, uh, let's see, I think you guys... Oh, yeah, the language change and the bullying. Legitimate, age-appropriate pedagogical techniques are not considered harassment or bullying. Change to a student's discomfort with classroom topics, classroom discussion, or classroom management is not by itself harassment or bullying. I'm hoping you might be able to add some definition to that, because uh, I have faced a bullying principle before, and your HR department typically tends to lean towards protecting your staff. That's how you wind up with a person who is abusing children in Wake Forest to get moved to another school area so that the parents don't know what's happening and then it takes years and the police finally report and then finally something gets done. So, you know, I don't think that's where uh, you need to be focused on. But uh, also, if like, for example, you're reading a book and it's inappropriate and the student feels uncomfortable, does the student get to opt out of having to read it? Thank you. Council Member Rao. Thank you. Steve Rao, uh, Council Member, Town of Mooresville. Superintendent Moore, Chair Mahaffey, Vice Chair Agrity, and members of the school board, uh, I'm here today not only as an elected official, but as a proud parent of students who went through the Wake County school system. My daughter, Sonia, is a junior at UNC School of Journalism, and my son, Ryan, is a rising senior, is a senior at Panther Creek. And I just want to, first of all, congratulate all the new school board members. Um, I, I, on a personal point of personal privilege, Chris Haggerty is one of my best friends. I really love him. It's been a hard year for him, and uh, we're very proud of you. Um, Real quickly, I wanted to also say, as the longest serving Asian American in the state, I congratulate Dr. Ng for bringing Asian representation to the Wake County School Board. I want to spend the remainder of my comments um, sharing with you a quote, which I heard at a Hindu temple. And speaking of Hinduism, uh, I got a text today to thank the school board and Wake County Schools for making Diwali 2024 a teacher work day and holy in 2025. The quote was from a Swami at BAPS Temple who said, coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress, and working together is success. I think these words really exemplify the journey of getting a new high school in Morrisville. For years, the council and citizens of Morrisville residents struggled. We came together, and Mayor Colley was here earlier today, but he and my colleagues in the council and previous councils worked hard to argue for a new school. We stayed together. But I want to focus on the working together, the progress which made us execute for a new school. And we have to, I come here before today to thank the school board for two things. Collaboration, because you brought so many different partners to the table. Wake County schools, Wake County commissioners, the staff, the residents of Morrisville, working with the bond and Wake Tech, putting it all together for a new public high school, historic in Morrisville, that's going to open in 2027. Our residents are thrilled. Our council is delighted. And we're very proud that we were able to make this happen and we built a model for other local governments to follow. So we thank you. I want to end my comments on STEM education. But I want to end with a story about a West Virginian whom I know very well, John T. Chambers, the former CEO of Cisco Systems. What many people don't know about John is he was a dyslexic and his school teachers and many people gave up on him. But he went on to run a company that became $47 billion and had 10,000 employees that made millions of dollars. He said that 40% of the jobs we know of today will be automated away, but we could create 15 million new jobs. And the way we can create those jobs is what we're doing at our early career high school. So I just want to share the Chambers story and hope that there's some child out there that can look at John Chambers. I recommend you reading his book, Lessons for Leadership in Startup World, to tell a story. Thank you. Happy holidays. Santos on his way. <laughs> Thank you. He's coming our, to Morrisville. Our next speaker is M. Rayford. M. Rayford. Next up is Daniel Grant King. Is Mr. Grant King here? No. Sean Pollins. Hey, Carrie said she was winging it earlier, but I'm really winging it today. Um, 
It's a long drive from my side of town. I didn't get a chance to write a speech, but I came here today because I've been talking about some issues for a long time, and I wanted to have the new board members have a chance to hear them and maybe uh, get some action on some things. So um, you may know I'm Sean Pollins. I ran for school board in 2018. I'm the first openly gay person that I'm aware of to run for a seat on the school board, uh, and that will be relevant later. Uh, first, I just want to say my mom's a retired teacher, and one of the reasons she quit her job early in this school system is because of the EL curriculum for English language arts in, I think, second through eighth grade. They use this curriculum now. It's a scripted curriculum. It tells the teachers what to do, when to say it, and how long to say it for. Um, it removed all creativity and, and passion from these classrooms, and teachers, I, I know the board just got some results back, uh, teacher feedback, and there's mixed mixed feelings from the staff. My solution that I've presented, and no one has told me why it's a bad idea. So if it is, if somebody could just like get my phone number from Roxy and call me and tell me why, you can do that. I'll accept it. I won't talk about it anymore, but I think it's a good idea. These curriculums come in modules. You can literally take a whole module out and say my mom could submit a new module to the school board or to staff to have it approved and then you can build a bank of curriculum materials. If we have the best teachers in the country like we say we do, we should rely on them to build a world class curriculum bank. Uh, lawyers do it with briefs. I don't know why we can't do it with curriculums. A minute and a half left to talk about free speech. Y'all know what's been going on at this um, podium for a year and a half, two years now, and I know there was a discussion in the policy committee about altering the way that you guys um, do your, pub your comments first, and then we come and give ours. Um, I, uh, let me just sum it up by saying that I, I struggled during this period listening to these people to call you all perverts and groomers and pedophiles, not even me. Um, but I know the history of my people and I know why they were doing that and I encourage each and every one of you, especially those who maybe like went to the General Assembly to give a similar speech, um, if you could just look up what the history of those words and why they're so harmful, you might be able to draw a connection between the acceptance of those words being delivered from this podium and say, a terrorist attack in a club in Colorado Springs or a terrorist attack here in Moore County. If you can't draw that line, then you need to resign. I have never said that before to any of you, but grow a spine or resign, okay? This is not a game. My people are under attack, and this is why I should have written a speech, because I was going to write down, be positive. I'm so sorry I did that to y'all. I really am trying to turn over a new leaf, but um, this is a serious issue, and it's been playing out in our state and in my community for too long, and I would just really like your support on this. Um, please fix your policy so that you can take the lead, and I don't have to come here anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pollins. Our next speaker is Jennifer Barrett. Oh, I did write a speech. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Jennifer Barrett, and I am representing families that have students coping with emotional and behavioral issues. The reason I wanted to speak with you all today is to talk about an issue about limiting resources to at-risk neurodivergent students. I'm speaking about the policies primarily at South Garner High School, but addressing this concern could help students in many schools. The policy that I am concerned about is that students are no longer allowed access to their personal therapist. From what I have been told by the school's administration is that there is a concern that students who are at risk for self-harm would call their therapist for help and not notify student services. I understand the school's hesitation, but it is misguided. As part of a student's crisis plan, they should reach out to student services first and try to de-escalate what the resources provided. It is only when those resources fail to work or are unavailable that a student should be able to access additional resources. A student will be more likely to disclose what is really going on with a therapist that a student is already familiar with and by, by being able to call their therapist, issues such as self-harm or violence or any other critical issue can be avoided. If an incident such as self-harm were a concern, the therapist could reach out to the school psychologist. A simple signed waiver would take care of any HIPAA concerns. According to Christina Duvall, a licensed clinical social worker at Hope Services in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
In terms of mental health with children, it is critical that parents, therapists, and school administration are all interconnected and involved in the child's therapeutic process, especially in terms of crisis, even in an academic environment. It is imperative that the child be able to communicate with all necessary supports and follow outlined safety plan to assist the child in de-escalation. This communication does not equate to the child being discouraged from reaching out to the school staff when feeling unsafe. However, the child must be able to contact outside therapeutic support if needed. If there is a concern that the student would be losing instructional time, the opposite would be true. A student would be able to return to class sooner and remain in school while being calmer. By reaching out to trusted therapist after all other methods of de-escalation have failed, there would be a much more likely ability of crisis not occurring. Our goal is the same, to keep our students safe, and only by working together as a united team with this open communication can this happen. It is my request that we keep our students safe by allowing them access to their therapeutic team when necessary. And thank you for giving me the time to speak with you today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Spears. Congratulations, Chair Mahaffey and Vice Chair Hagerty. Hello to the new team of 10. Hello, Superintendent Moore and district staff. I'm Christina Spears, the current president of Wake NCAE. We call ourselves Team Wake Wins, and it feels appropriate tonight to celebrate some wins with you all. Um, and I believe in deeply giving folks their flowers while they can still smell them. So that's what I'm going to do for our outgoing as well as our new um, board members tonight. So gratitude first at, to outgoing going board member Heather Scott for her dedication to public school workers, students, and families. I'm always impressed with how well Ms. Scott knows her schools and her community. She'll definitely be missed. And congratulations to new board member Ms. Cheryl Caulfield. I'm looking forward to working with you and getting to know you. Gratitude to re-elected board member Monika Johnson-Hosler for your dedication to public schools and your consistent commitment to serving your community for years with a heart of justice. I'm looking forward to seeing how your institutional knowledge will be used on this new board. Gratitude to outgoing board member Roxy Cash for her commitment to health and safety for our students and staff. And congrats to board member Wing Ning for thank you for, in advance for your service to our public school community. Gratitude to newly elected board member Tara Waters for your fierce advocacy for our most marginalized students and families, for your willingness to step up last year, and for running again this year to serve your hometown team. Gratitude to outgoing board member Dr. Jim Martin for his advocacy over the course of many years on this board. I know educators and my members won't forget his diligence in keeping us safe during a global pandemic. And then congrats and welcome to Ms. Lynn Edmonds for agreeing to serve as a newly elected board member after years of being a champion for public schools. Gratitude to outgoing board member Christine Kushner, who has known me since I was a student teacher in this district for her calm, consistent leadership on this board. And congrats to do board member Sam Hershey. I'm excited to see a parent who's a proud public school parent to serve on our board. Gratitude to Chris Hagerty for your resilience and dedication to our public schools through hard times this year and beyond. I appreciate how you ask good questions and you're willing to have tough conversations. Gratitude to re-elected board member Lindsay Mahaffey for your service to Wake County community and always bringing your lens as a parent and educator to your role. Gratitude to newly elected board member, my, this one might make me emotional, uh, my former colleague and my friend Tyler Swanson. I'm just proud of you. Almost two years ago, to this date, we protested outside of this building for safer working conditions for our students and ourselves. So thanks for accepting this leadership role. And I want to show appreciation to Karen Carter, a special education colleague, for her service to students and families in District 9. Thank you all for willing to serve. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Our final speaker tonight is Diane Chandler. Okay, so I'm part of the people who did not write a speech because I was not planning to be here, which is why I'm not, I signed up at 2.30 to speak. Um, 
And I was pleasantly surprised that we were back with pre-COVID, apparently guidelines that I could sign up at the last minute. I'm asking you that we return to pre-COVID guidelines for all policies. Why am I here? Because I was home with a sick child, which many of us parents in Wake County have been lately, because there's sickness going around. And then I got a message from his teacher asking me what his symptoms are. His teacher is not a medical professional. I have no obligation to tell her what my child's symptoms are. Before COVID, there was no obligation to tell anyone what their symptoms were. There was a policy set for, for uh, when they could return, okay? And she tells me that it's because of COVID policy. So I go online and I didn't do all the research because I didn't have much time. But I clicked through because it said that we follow the uh, CDC guidelines. Guidelines, right? So, quick through. It says people who have symptoms of respiratory or gas, uh, gastrointestinal infections, such as cough, fever, sore throat, vomiting, and diarrhea, should stay home. Testing is recommended for people with symptoms of COVID. Does not say required. That are required to go back to school. Okay. Then it also says that it should get get guidelines to be concerning it to line up with community levels of COVID. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's no big community levels of COVID right now. There is many, I found many articles of how high a flu is right now. Okay, it's a flu. And there's no required negative test to return for a flu. All that's required is to be fever-free and symptom-free. Us parents can decide that. There's no negative token I need to send to send my child back to school. Okay, we need to go back to prior sick policies, fever free, vomiting free for 24 hours. It's time the parents can make the decision because all the all the teachers are caring about is whether or not the child has COVID when there are other symptoms out, the other things. That's what we need to be concerned about. There's flu, there's strep, okay? And we, us parents can make the decision of when to send a child back. We've been doing it for years, okay? The policy out there, the policy, it, it already show on the website what fever free, volunteer free is there. Next time to go back to that. Thank you, Ms. Chandler. We hope your child feels better soon. He does, and he will be coming to school. Good to hear. Uh, that concludes public comment. Next on our agenda is our information items, which is our superintendent updates. Superintendent Moore. We did not have a work session today, so I don't have any updates from the work session. Um, we had, as you know, the um, swearing in of all of the board members that were elected, <clears throat> including four returning and five new, um, followed um, by the annual meeting. So just um, congratulations to Ms. Mahaffey and Mr. Haggerty and to all of the new and returning board members. That's my update. All right. Thank you, Superintendent Moore. Board members, we are now on to agenda item eight, the consent items. Is there a motion to approve the consent items? Sorry, Chair Mahaffey, I would move um, approval of the items on the consent agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Swanson with his first second. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those uh, in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? say nay. All right. The consent items pass. We move on to our action items. And board members, um, as we spoke with many of you prior to this meeting, our three action items tonight are items that you will normally find on the consent agenda. But we felt that as we move forward, it's kind of important to get familiar with some items that you may see coming through. Um, and so we're going to begin with finance and gifts to the system. And Mark Winters is joining us, and he is our finance officer. 
Thank you, Chairman Mahaffey, members of the board, and Superintendent Moore. Tonight, we've been asking you to bring an item on your action agenda. As Ms. Mahaffey said, that would normally be found on the consent agenda. We want to bring this to the board tonight so we can provide some basic background on this item. Board Policy 2410, Public Gifts to the Schools, directs the superintendent and staff to examine gifts to schools in the, or gifts to the system and to submit a summary of these items to the board for action. It's been our practice to bring these items monthly to the board to comply with Board Policy 2410 and in full transparency. Tonight we bring this monthly report of gifts to the systems and you'll find in assembly a backup document with a detailed listing of this month's report of gifts in the amount of $102,128. We now ask for your consideration for approval and we'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Winters. So before we move to discussion, we do require a motion and a second. So is there anyone that would like to make a motion to approve gifts to the system? Motion to approve gifts to the system. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is there any questions or items that you'd like to ask Mr. Winters? Ms. Edmonds. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Winters. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I was surprised. I looked over the document, and I was just curious as to why things like a $10 purchase of hanging file folders and um, a $25 purchase of dry erase markers was reported on this and wondering if that's if the person donating just requested a record of it or if parents still go to schools and donate markers and dry erasers as a gift and it doesn't we don't see that. Yeah, so for transparency and for a record, we do report all gifts. Some of the smaller gifts, if it's if it's money, sometimes they will be combined with others. If it's less than twenty-five dollars, and somebody gave five dollars or ten dollars, and one school had up to twenty-five dollars, we put it in as a lump sum number. But we do want to record all items to have record of all items that we have in the school system. Although it's not taxpayers' dollars, we still feel it's important to show what's been given to the schools and that we have ownership. And there's a little bit of an internal control built into that piece, too, that you know where these items are going. So in a scenario of the beginning of the year and a parent comes in with a bag of tissues and wipes, what have you, is it the teacher that is recording who brings those materials in? Is that how this works? So usually the teacher will share with the, with the school's uh, lead secretary or bookkeeper. And they fill out a report and then turn it over to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great questions. Any others? Okay. Seeing none, move to the vote. All those in favor of approving this, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, nay? Thank you, Mr. Winters. Thank you. All right, we now move on to an item uh, that is normally on consent out of our facilities group, and that is uh, Mark Strickland, our Chief of Facilities and Operations, will be here to present Design Consultant Agreement, Weatherstone Elementary Systems Upgrade Project. Thank you, Chair Mahaffey, members of the board and superintendent. I, too, uh, was one of the lucky ones to get to present to you all tonight. In front of you tonight for your consideration is a design consultant agreement for work at Weatherstone Elementary School. Uh, we conducted uh, interviews with uh, our request for qualifications and have selected or recommended Dewberry engineers to perform the design work at Weatherstone Elementary. This work will be for the heating, ventilation, air conditioning, fire alarm, intercon, and lighting upgrades at the school. And our recommendation tonight would be for you all to approve a contract with Dewberry Engineers in the amount of $262,576. All right. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Is there a motion to approve and a second? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Water. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this item? Mr. Hershey. Thanks, Mr. Strickland. Um, do these contracts ever have uh, built-in, we talked earlier about the built-in money for uh, bids for schools and the market volatility. 
Do so these contracts have that kind of thing built into them, too? Not to the extent that we discussed. These contracts do have contingencies in them, and they are hard bid. And so once we get the price along with the contingency, that should fall within the funding that we have for the project. So not the, the market volatility piece. Mm -hmm. Although in putting budgets together, we do consider that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, nay? Thank you. Thank you. All right, our final action item comes out of the Office of the Chief of Staff, and joining us is our Chief of Staff and Strategic Planning, Dr. Clinton Robinson. Dr. Robinson. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, good evening, and good evening. And first of all, let me just say congratulations to each and every one of you. And it's going to be an honor working with you as we continue to move forward to positively impact student academic achievement and learning. North Carolina Statute 115C47 grants local school boards of education the power and authority to accept, receive, and administer any funds granted under the provisions of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, other federal acts, or funds from foundations or other private sources. In accordance with 115C47, all grant funding opportunities shall be presented to the board for review and approval. All funding opportunities are aligned to our strategic priorities and included in the uh, supplemental material that you have, you will see brief narratives associated with them as well. This evening, I present the following grant funding opportunities for board approval. All right, thank you, Dr. Robinson. Is there a motion? A motion to approve the grant funds. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Are there any questions for Dr. Robinson? Yes, sir. So, Dr. Robinson, sometimes we'll get a list at our board meetings of different grants, different sizes, mostly somewhat small. But then other times we might have a grant that's particularly notable, like some of the magnet school grants that we get because of their size and, and their impact. What really is the criteria for when a grant goes on the consent agenda or comes to us for action? So let me take a stab at that. <clears throat> um, all grants yeah. should come to the board for approval um, to to um, not to receive the grant, but to apply for the grant. And so we cover broad territory. We will not apply for all of the grants that are on the consent agenda this evening. It is seeking board approval so that if a school or a division or a department is interested in the grant, they will then apply for it. And depending on what that type of grant is, like the larger ones that require other pieces of board approval, you will see those. But some of the smaller ones that might be for supporting a teacher project Project or something at a school or a STEM activity um, that come through a grant organization would be approved on the front end, and then if schools applied for it, they would receive that grant. That wouldn't have to come back to the board. So it, it's all of them. We don't apply for all of these. These are just everything that is out there um, that school might choose to apply for or a district or department might choose to apply for. All right. Great. Dr. Ng? So um, um, once uh, a school or, or a um, uh, a teacher, a faculty, or a principal applies for a, um, these grants. Is there a record of uh, how that money is being applied? Yes, we have a grants office that works directly with schools to take all of the information down that's required for a grant, and all of that is recorded. Any further questions? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. And uh, as part of your orientation, you will meet with all of these fine folks that came in front of us and can ask more extensive questions and learn more about um, the organization and uh, what they represent. Um, board members, if you will go to closed session for our new board members, if you see something with that paper clip next to it, that means there are attached documents. So you can click on the supporting documents and see the motion that is coming for our closed session agenda. Um, and at this time, I will take a motion to enter closed session. Chair Mahaffey? Yes, sir. At this time, I would move that the board move into closed session to consider confidential personal information protected under General Statute 143.318.11A1A3 
to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the board in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the board, and to consult with and instruct board staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by on or on behalf of the board on the particulars of the acquisition of the real property having Wake County property identification number 17316453370 and REID real estate ID number 0270780 for public infrastructure improvements related to the Pleasant Plains Elementary School site and to receive the board's instructions as to the position to be taken on behalf of the board in negotiations in relation thereto. Further, to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the board in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the board, and to consult with and instruct board staff or negotiating agents concerning the position to be taken by or on behalf of the board in negotiation of price and other material terms of a proposed contract for the acquisition of real property in Morrisville, North Carolina, High School 14 site, being a portion of a parcel having Wake County PIN 0746-86-7. And finally, to consult with the Board of Education attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege as provided for under General Statute 143.318.11a3. Due to current litigation, Dylan James Horwin and Michael E. Horwin versus Wake County Board of Education and Ben Godot, both in his capacity as an employee and individually, Wake County file number 22CVS013060. Thank you, Vice Chair Haggerty. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Johnson Hostler. Any questions? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor of entering into closed session for the reasons previously stated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? We are now in closed session. Thank you.